photo of my university, the Chinese University of Hong Kong. It's extremely beautiful. It's an entire mountain, so you climb up and down the mountain. Um, what do you think might be fake about this picture? What is one of the problems in China and Hong Kong? Air pollution. I heard that. Right. So this colour sky is almost certainly fake. Um, so remember that, that uh, technology gives you the opportunity to slightly cheat, um, and that's a good thing. My centre is the Centre for Learning Enhancement and Research. You see the C, the L, the E, the A and the R. It is the most unclear logo for CLEAR. Um, but it is a lovely acronym and basically the centre's job is to make teaching and learning clear. But more importantly, and I'm, I'm going to, because part of the challenge that I'm going to give to folk today is this word research. That one of the, the problems about innovation in general, and I don't see myself or the centre as being about e-learning. It's, it's about good teaching and learning and about changing teaching and learning in order to enhance it, hence the learning enhancement bit. But it requires evidence. And when teachers change their teaching, like any process of scholarship, you need to sort of reflect on it. There was the example of students reflecting on a learning journey through a degree. The same way I think the imperative is for teachers to also produce research, but I'll get to that a bit later on. What is the most important thing for students to learn at Taylor's U or at any university? Just want one or two word answers. I'll give you a, just like 30 seconds to come up with a couple. What do you want your students to go away from their degree or diploma studies having that they didn't have when they came in? Well, how are you evaluating to them? Okay, all right, so you're allowed to talk. Collaborative learning is, is acceptable. Okay. They need to learn how to learn. Right, they need to learn how to learn. Any other suggestions? Learning how to learn is one, absolutely. Independent learning. What else? Learning how to think about what to learn. Learning how to think about what to learn. Excellent. So that extra critical component. Any other suggestions in the back row? I will get to you then. Okay. All right. But notice I, I did this this morning with some teachers and I did it more interestingly with a packed lecture theatre of students. And they said the same thing, that what they really think they need to go out is a capacity of being able to be independent learners, about being how to manage other people. They thought that was important. They thought the ability to find information was important. And all of this was, was nothing about any discipline. And yet if I ask you what you teach, you will tell me, oh, I teach pharmacy, or I teach communication studies, or I teach hospitality, or I... But in reality, what we, what we're, if we think about it, we're looking at is um, these sort of big generic capabilities. So if we're thinking about changing teaching, which is really what the university's agenda is in the use of technology, presumably it's about enhancing teaching, then it's about using technology in ways that will uh, facilitate students developing these important capabilities. Uh, and if it's just more teaching of the discipline, I'm not convinced it's worth the effort personally. And if I show you what I think is the 21st century literacies, it's, it's a number. You know, when I went through university, which was many, many decades ago, it was about written literacy. Um, but now you see we're, just to pick a couple, we're about linguistic literacies, global literacies, visual, cultural literacy. So students moving out into, into the workplace now are about developing a number of literacies. I'm on my fourth career at the moment, I think. Maybe it's fifth, I'm not sure. But I started off as a theoretical chemist. My PhD is actually in Zulu linguistics, believe it or not. Um, and, um, and then I became a multimedia designer, and then I became a teaching and learning 
um, facilitator, I guess. And, and that sort of pathway where you move through a number of careers and a no number of contexts and a number of iterations is what life in the 21st century is about. Now, I think the students are aware of that, perhaps even more than we are. In my university, this is e-learning. Do you see anything about e there in this diagram over here? This is the core. And this diagram actually exists in the university's teaching and learning policy. Uh, it says nothing about technology. If you're designing a program or a course, understand what the students, who the students are, Make sure you think clearly about why you're trying to actually run this particular program or course. Select content and learning activities which are going to facilitate those learning outcomes. Vitally, have assessment that is linked to learning outcomes. There's not much point in having critically evaluate or high problem solving or whatever in your learning outcomes if you have low level multiple choice items as your assessment, I mean, obviously. Coming back to my research theme, monitoring to see how effective learning is, is an important part, in my view, uh, effective learning design. And then finding out whether or not the students at the end actually learnt anything. Now, that's what learning design is. And because we're in a situation where there's lots of technology around, then it's possible to actually use technology to support that. But the use of e-learning is not, if someone says to me, um, I want to use Moodle or I want to use Blackboard, I'll say, is that really the question you want to ask me? Or do you want to ask me a question which is, how might students, uh, how might I design some experiences for students that enable them to get better communication skills? I mean, there is a real difference. Talking about the tools as if they're an end in themselves is, I think, counterproductive. So when institutions talk about rolling out Blackboard or rolling out Moodle, as I think may happen here, or talk about an e-portfolio system or talk about whatever else it is, um, I'm not convinced that that's the right terminology. I'm more interested in saying, let's review uh, course design, program design, and talk about how to get better learning experiences for students that will facilitate their, their sort of learning. Here's some examples. Finding out about students, having diagnostic testing at the beginning of the term, find out how much they actually know. Because nobody knows all the stuff they studied in the year before. Uh, find out about students' learning preferences, learning styles. There are differences between students. And there's lots of easy ways you can do that with various online uh, questionnaires and quizzes. Using media-enhanced explanations and animations. Again, there's heaps of stuff online. Um, how many of you use TED Talks? T-E-D Talks. Right, homework. Put T-E-D talks into Google and you will find a whole world of amazing short video clips on lots and lots of topics. Really interesting speakers who, who can uh, provide triggers of explanations about things. Um, the Khan Academy, anyone use the Khan Academy? K-H-A-N Academy? Great stuff. Quick, simple, tutorials, very low uh, tech sort of production, but really simple material that actually is really useful on basic concepts. So there's heaps of stuff. Just TED Talks and the Khan Academy alone would provide, uh, you know, let alone YouTube by itself, just even searching YouTube. So we actually have heaps of stuff without going to any of the fancy repositories like um, MIT online, the, the MIT Courseware repository, uh, the Open University in the UK has OpenLearn. All this stuff is free, all this stuff is there. So, and, and it's there to actually use um, for content. This is more interesting. Right. How many folk here regularly use online discussions? Right. Okay, 
How many people here regularly use quizzes? Occasionally use quizzes? Ah, right, okay, then we, we, we're getting there, right? Good, good, good. Uh, games? Games? Fun? Yeah, cool. Simulations? Where you ask, you know, give students a case? Yep, yeah, right, cool. Um, debates? People love arguing. How many of you are married? <laughs> Right, I'm not going to necessarily put the two together, but guess who in, in wins the arguments in our family? Um, uh, role plays. Um, yeah, fabulous. I mean, one of the first role plays I ever did online was with midwives at RMIT University. When the web first came up and the first forums became available, we put our midwives into the forum, we gave them roles, and we got them to consider what happens in this crisis. Now, um, I don't know how many of you have had babies or had wives who've had babies, but you know things happen in, in a delivery room and you don't normally have three hours to think about it. So they'd have a discussion in an asynchronous forum to think about all these possible scenarios. The actual exam for this course was online. And the exam was in a simultaneous chat room. And the, the midwife would be given a problem and have to absolutely respond in, I don't know, 20 seconds, 30 seconds. It was a wonderful use of technology. Um, you know, you can kill heaps of virtual babies, and that's a lot better than killing real ones. And the same is true for, for all those professional scenarios. You can, you can practice online. So, you know, this idea of using uh, role plays online is very powerful, but very low tech. See, often teachers are, are, are concerned about how high tech they have to get in using technology. You don't. Uh, I personally think discussion forums and chat rooms provide some tremendous opportunities and they're, they're certainly in my university underused. There's lots and lots of this stuff around um, that, and that's got better and it's got more sophisticated and it's not just boring notes and PowerPoints. But we probably at Chinese University uh, do not have enough of this and yet that's where the power is. That's where students really get things. Um, I'm going to say more about peer reviews later because I think they're, um, I've been saying it all day, that I think they're, they're really good. Because one of the things I want to persuade you is that you're working too hard, um, that getting involved in technology should be taking a load off you, not adding to it, and so on. The idea of reflective spaces, blogs, e-portfolios. All of this, though, notice that everything in the red fluffy clouds is to support the learning design. The essence is the learning design. So don't ask the question, how can I use this tool? It's how can I support what I'm trying to do with students for their learning? And I think it becomes less of a, and, and if it becomes, if the technology gets in the way of what you're trying to do, then probably it's, it's um, you know, it's not appropriate at that time. PowerPoint slide 397. I told the story again this morning of uh, the University Grants Committee in Hong Kong likes to keep a check on the universities, very much likes to. And they were visiting one day and they wanted to speak to the deans. The deans in my university tend to be slightly older male persons. And uh, I was asked if I would help them do a bit of a dry run on these presentations. And I had one dean, they had 10 minutes each. I had one dean who came in with 120 PowerPoint slides for 10 minutes. He got through 90 of them. That's pretty good going. You try nine a minute. And each of them was all packed with stuff. So I, I think, you know, this is not, to me, blended learning. This is not the effective use of technology. These are our graduates, and there are two studies, and I've been repeating these during the day because I think they're important. It may be different if you do similar studies here, but the point is, is to actually find out your students' perceptions and find out what their views are. And in this particular case, I took 21 of the best courses where teachers were doing lots of activity 
And so the students actually had a genuine experience of what I would call good learning design. And I asked them what they thought of the website to describe the information component of the website and describe the interactive component of the website. There wasn't any relationship between the two. So in other words, lots of that didn't mean lots of that and lots of that didn't mean lots of that. So by and large, these were two independent components of the website. Um, however, if you ask students what constitutes really good learning, forgetting the, forgetting the technology, just asking them about their learning, then they will say that the sorts of things where they learn communication skills, where they do group work, where there's a focus on literacies, uh, fundamental concepts, not facts, um, relevant applications and problem solving. If you ask them if that sort of stuff, if they're developing those sorts of things, then they will feel motivated. In other words, the Chinese university students are saying that they want to be engaged in authentic problem solving and the development of these capabilities that we talked about. Okay, so, so it's a myth. It's an absolute myth, certainly at my university, that students want the soft option. Students don't. You know, they, they may occasionally say they do, but that's because they just simply also want to get marks. But if you get them involved with the best, te the teachers who get the highest teaching evaluations are the teachers who by and large have the more difficult courses. And that we've shown in a number of studies at the university. So, students want to get engaged in this sort of stuff they, and that's what motivates them and gives them a deep approach to their studies. Have a guess, given that these are independent, is it information or interactive features that gets them feeling uh, about the websites, to get some feeling that they're developing these things. Those who think it's information. Those who think it's interactive features. Right, well, at least we have one vote. Um, the answer is the constructive dialogue. If you look at, and this is just one study, um, if you look at students' perceptions they do not see any relationship to having lots of information online and developing the sorts of uh, capabilities and skills that, that we actually really want them to develop. If you ask them, they say that these are the sorts of things, communication, interactive features, what I call their constructive dialogue, actual interaction with content and interaction with other, other students and with their teachers, that's what they find effective about e-learning. And, um, and if you ask them a different question, because this is, no long, this is not a perfect university, if I ask my teacher, if I ask my students, do you want notes and PowerPoints, they'll also say yes. And why do they say yes? Because that's what's rewarded in the exams. So changing the, the pattern of university teaching is about changing the assessment. As soon as the assessment is authentic, in other words, it's genuine problem solving, you know, real case studies and so on, then um, they will come up with this sort of pattern. Now, as I said, these, this was, these were the, what I call the good course designs. Um, students only ask for notes and PowerPoints when the assessment is reproductive. Um, if they have to regurgitate lots of stuff, then of course they want the sort of shortened version of what they have to learn. Um, but um, if, we, if we're serious about them developing literacies, then um, I think we need to think about these sorts of things. Now, these are online as well as offline. You know, I mean, you, you can have a role play in a class. Um, as well as you can have it online. And sometimes you might want it in the class and sometimes you might want it online. I, I think it's not an either or process. It's a question of choosing how to design a particular course in a way that best facilitates what the students need to learn. And I think the, the technology does work um, in many cases. 
Um, my university has a crisis on classrooms. Every university has a crisis on classrooms, but more importantly, has a crisis on timetabling. Um, and so my, my solution is, why don't we cut some of the classes and have more online activities? Students are fine with that. They, they do not want online courses. What they want is the appropriate blend. And that, that of course, is, you know, is something that has to be determined within each particular program, I think. But the evidence, certainly from our students, is that they're really keen. If I ask students, it's a separate study, if I ask students how much they use technology at my university, it's actually not very much, except, unfortunately, for notes and PowerPoints. You know, we've got a long way to go on this one, I think. Uh, and, it's, and, and I'm not saying that, that, you know, some notes and PowerPoints aren't useful, but if you ask them what else they would like to have, which is the blue, notice that the blue bar, in every case, is higher. Uh, students actually want the use of technology. And I, I'm not convinced by teachers who tell me that students don't want technology. Maybe teachers say that, but the students don't say it. Um, and, if, and more importantly, if you, in that data set, if you look at the students who report a higher use of technology, in other words, the higher end students, they're even more positive about the use of technology. So those that have technology want even more of it, and, um, and they're actually quite keen on it. So here's two studies. That's a Chinese U. Now, my guess is that they weren't terribly difficult to do. They're two surveys, basically. Um, my guess is that learning what the, stu the students at Taylor's University want is really quite important. I mean, I spoke to, I don't know, however many people fit in this lecture theatre, um, a couple of hours ago, and they were pretty well disposed. I mean, of course they wanted better wireless and they wanted better infrastructure in general, but they were not, uh, they were, were not saying, no, we don't want um, the use of technology. Any comments at that point? My back row? Any comments? Do you agree with me? Good, right, okay. Excellent. So then there's no barriers at all. Um, however, there's another point about this. That, um, is anyone here underemployed? I mean, anyone who's got like spare time and nothing to do? <laughs> all right. So, so you're actually all overworked. All right. Um, it's a ridiculous situation, but it's true. And it's therefore time to stop doing the students' work for them. It's a work smarter, not harder thing. My current sort of uh, move to uh, get people interested in, in thinking about learning design is to say that the students, not the teachers, you've all got degrees. You don't need to do another degree again. All right? And this is, tends to be what's happening. It certainly is at my university that there's so much concern and care for the students that the teachers are actually doing the work for them. Um, they're almost writing the exam papers for them. So think carefully about how students develop capabilities. They develop capabilities by actually doing the work themselves. So here's some suggestions. There's three suggestions I've got here. Handing controls of students. I think, you know, if you are going to use forums, it should be for students. Students producing the learning resources and students doing peer assessment. And I'll go through these um, quickly. This is uh, an analysis of 13 forums at Chinese U. And I had a staff member who went, in my view, a little over the top. But anyway, he was enjoying himself. What he did was do surveys and focus groups about, you know, what was the best thing about these particular tasks and so on. We looked at the quality of postings in terms of their uh, higher order thinking, um, and we just looked at the, you know, frequency and, and so on. The, without going into all the ins and outs of it, um, basically the forums that were most effective, in other words, had the highest pro proportion of um, sort of higher order responses, really, uh, you know, substantial ones, um, and were, um, you know, had, had, you know, a lot of postings, perhaps, 
If you say to students, you have to post three things and you only get three things from each student, then it's probably not a successful forum. What you want are things which are lively and engaged and so on. So if we looked across all of this data, the forums that are successful are structured. Uh, I think online coffee shops are a waste of time. Virtual coffee doesn't taste very good. So, you know, I mean, social chit-chat sort of stuff is, when's the assignment due next Tuesday? Thank you. Now, this is not, a, you know, a useful use of technology. So they're structured. They're around real-life cases, real-life problems. And, and it's not just sort of uh, professional cases. One of the most successful forums I um, sort of work with a teacher on, uh, any engineers here? Physicists? Scientists in general? Oh, right, okay, well, the scientists should be here. Um, this was a simple question, what is electricity? Can you define electricity for me? You try and start, you, you will probably end up defining electric current, electric voltage, concept of resistance, but defining what electricity is is actually very hard. It's, it, it, it's an abstract concept. So I, I ran this forum with a group of engineers that became an intensive debate about how to define a, a, a concept which is central to electronic engineering. And, and it was really successful. So sometimes it's hitting the right question. It has to be a meaningful question. So when I say structured, I don't mean necessarily a huge amount of detail, but pertinent, um, has rewards associated. So in our case, there's nothing like a few marks. It works really well. So it's a, if you think it's important, then it becomes part of what um, is uh, part of the course reward system. But structured, yes, student-centred. So in other words, if you look at forums where teachers keep popping in to help the conversation along, it's a bit like overprotective parents. And overprotective parents are not necessarily the best parents. Um, so you have to let students go, which means that sometimes there are things written in the forum which are a little bit unclear, a bit sort of students trying to find things out. It may well be you make a judgment to come in and correct something which is really <coughs> going to be problematic. But leaving the students to explore by themselves is really quite important. Anyone here made a podcast? Anyone made a video that they put online themselves? No? Okay, right. Um, so by and large, you, you, anyone actually accessed YouTube and used that in classes? Yeah, right. In other words, number one, people are doing using existing social media and actually using. Number two, we had a lot of teachers at our university who were spending a great deal of time producing resources themselves. You know, actually making little videos, making podcasts, making, you know, stuff. Um, and then creating them. The teachers who handed it to the students and said, what I want you to do is to develop um, you know, some e-cases or some little video clips or whatever. Um, and, and then you ask both the teachers, the students, and the other students how useful that is. And number three wins, because the students actually have to really think about the nature of the concept that's being explored. So don't think that getting involved in e-learning means that you've got to actually produce the resources. You either use stuff that's out there or you get the students to do it. I, I seriously think that you know, teachers needn't spend all that time. You're, you've got to think of the task that the students need to actually get engaged with. Final one is it's my favourite, and I've been saying it all day. This, to me, is a really good example of a learning design. And it only uses a forum. All right? So what it is, and this is a business example, it's been running now for, I guess, nine years. So it's tried and tested. And what's 
more important is that the teacher who started this, a number of his colleagues are now doing similar sorts of activities. Why? And uh, without, before I even describe why, because his teaching evaluation scores went way up. And uh, other teachers saw that this was you know, popular and, and he was being successful and uh, students were saying great things about him. So they started to think about it as well. Now, very simple. Instead of just getting students to do problem-based learning, you structure it a bit more carefully. So you've got a case. In this case, it's investment banking. There are two groups of students. There's purple group and green group. The purple group are the problem solvers. And it's quite structured. Because I do think learning design needs to be structured. I, I think that if, you're, if the teachers aren't going to be holding students' hand, then they need to get the structure quite well defined. The first stage is warming up, where you identify the key issues. So group, purple group, writes a little report on what are the key issues in this particular case and what might be, we be exploring. And the green group gives them feedback. Second stage, they dig in, which means they find some resources. They go to the World Bank. They go to other you know, uh, places, find resources. And they, again, the minders give them feedback, suggest other resources. So the minders have to really do the case as well. But they don't have to write anything. All I have to do is to give feedback to the purple group. Then the third group is the working out, which is solving the case, coming up with some sort of resolution or suggested plan forward or business case or whatever it might be. And again, the minders give them feedback. And then we finally get to the evaluation assessment stage where the minders actually give them a mark. All right? Now, all of this goes on over a question of a couple of weeks or however long it is, and then they switch roles. So if the green lot were nasty, the purple lot get the opportunity to be the same. All right? So it tends to have checks and balances in the system. So you don't get, um, you don't get overly critical minders because they know that you know, this is not going to be productive for learning. And so it's taken quite seriously by both groups. So they basically do two cases. And that's the entire learning design. The reports from students is that this is one of the most effective ways. Um, because they get lots of feedback and lots of you know, hints and support and so on along the way, um, they get that interactive uh, component with the other team. And the best thing for the teacher is he doesn't go on holiday, but you know, basically you sit back and let the students do the work. Otherwise, if you lecture about investment banking and you just go through all the processes and this and that and the other, you have no idea where the students are at the end of it. The end of the, this, the teacher, the teacher can at any stage be available for questions and so on. But this to me is what a good learning design is. Um, and it's very difficult to do without technology. It's the other reason I use this as an example, that um, it's easy to do in an online environment, very difficult to do if you're trying to email reports and get feedback by email. It just doesn't work. And if you're trying to schedule meetings where all of these people get together, that also doesn't work, and it's simply not necessary. Now, it might be that some of the meetings within the purple group or even within the green group are in the coffee shop. But the actual formal interchange in the document trail is all online. It, it's very simple. So I do not think you need to actually get into the, the, the more complicated bits of technology. Trying out something like this is a much better way. Has anyone tried anything similar to this? No? Well, I'm, I'm dead keen. I think it's really good. I, I think it's um, a very effective way. And you can have variants on that in order to get online role plays and so on. So r highly recommended one. I've got two take-home messages. One is the word work is associated with the learners. They do the work. The role of teachers is to design. That's your expertise. You will also give explanations. I mean, I'm going to give you two examples um, of what I mean about the difference between designing and doing a lot of teaching. Uh, 20 years ago, when I went back uh, as a multimedia designer, 
I had a project in chemistry at the University of Melbourne. And we designed uh, a large number of animations and representations of complex chemical concepts around reactions and stuff, okay? Anyway, so we developed these animations. The same animations are now used 20 years later. They've been ported from a standalone computer onto the web and so on, but the technology doesn't matter. The design of those animations is still being used in first year chemistry 20 years later. Now, that's fine, that's cool, there's lots of animations around, but what was more important is what happened to the course. Before it, it was three lectures and one tutorial, standard classic university course. What we did was we made it one lecture and three tutorials. And in those tutorials, students either worked through these online tutorials, which had all these really nice media examples in them, or they did collaborative workshops, um, or occasionally the whole thing was online. Um, and then in the one lecture, uh, what was interesting is that my role as the designer was to sort of help the, the, the was two chemists who were doing it, very experienced chemistry professors. And they said this was really difficult. Because they thought, as a lecturer, if you come in, you've got PowerPoint there, and you go, dun, 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 and you give explanations of the discipline. It's quite easy. If instead, what you're trying to do is pick key concepts and have explanations around the difficult stuff without all the easy stuff in the middle, it's actually quite hard. So what we would do is that every Friday, we would send the two lecturers a uh, report from the online system that said what were the problems that students found difficult. So they would go into the class on Monday or Tuesday or whenever it was and, and actually work with the concepts that the students found difficult. Now the students really valued those lectures because they were focused on specific things that they found you know, hard to understand and then they would also sort of try and anticipate what might be a problem coming up. So that, that sort of concept of having lecturing, and they were lectures, they were still large, you know, a few hundred students. They were, they were lectures, but they were lectures that were focused on the sorts of things that were really of interest to the students. They weren't teaching them stuff that they already knew. So that was one really good learning design. That learning design has lasted for 20 years. Um, the other example I, I'll give is of 1,500 students at the University of Queensland in one course. So anyone, I asked somebody this morning if they had large classes and they said 50. Um, right. Is there anyone here who's got a class over 100? Oh, okay, good. Right, okay. We go, oh, that's right. Yes, you had 150. Um, uh, well, we had 1,500, so that's 10 times as big. And, and that design where we got students again to do something very similar to this sort of thing, to have stages in, um, in learning with 1,500 students. Now, they were in groups of four and they would solve their problem and then the people in, in the centre here, another group would actually peer assess. It wasn't quite as detailed in terms of feedback, but we've managed to get interactive um, you know, online experiences and genuine problem solving with 1,500 students in a course. Now, that's simply impossible. Now, I agree, no university should enrol 1,500 students in a course, but that's another issue. Um, but even with 150 students, getting that uh, potential for a teacher to give genuine feedback to them is actually impossible. So this sort of design is really cool. All right, so teachers are about designing. Students are about working. So stop doing the students' work for them. And the other one is back to this research thing, that um, one of the points about e-learning is the, just the simple amount of data you've got. Taylor's certainly, you know, from the fact that they've asked me to come over here today, 
was they're seriously interested in trying to develop a learning environment for students. Now, that means money. It's a serious investment. The thing about technology is that you're going, if you're going to sort out the Wi-Fi and all the lectures and get the lecture capture stuff and really look at a learning platform that's robust and has a good e-portfolio system and this and this and this and the other, it's going to take a fair investment. Now, if, if that investment is to pay off, as I said to the students earlier, it's partly their responsibility to make it clear about whether or not the sorts of experiences they're having are useful. Um, so partly it's their responsibility, but partly also it's teachers' responsibility to look at all of this data and to be fairly systematic about how you actually collect it. You know, often, often um, certainly in my university, I have to hunt to find the good cases. Finding those 21 cases was, was not easy. Uh, I used partly the web blog system, but partly my contacts and this and that and the other in order to find them. And what I think that developing a community whereby teachers you know, offer their experiences, good and not so successful, into the pool of experience that then is available for that communication is really important. Um, so that it's like any piece of research that you ask a question. These are questions on learning processes. And you think ahead of time. Okay, in this particular offer, I'm going to start up a bit of teamwork. You start up a bit of that, you know, one of those cases online and so on and get students together in teamwork. Let me find out exactly what's happening. What is the process that students are, are going through? Let me perhaps talk to some of them, get some reflective reports, obviously look at the web logs and so on. When you're designing the activity, you design the evaluation that goes along with it. And that sort of um, scholarly stuff, I think really useful. Um, I run a workshop at the Chinese University called, or I used to, called the Scholarship of Teaching and Learning. I mean, this is I am, I'm a professor of teaching and learning. Uh, guess how many people came? Yeah, three, yes, right. I turned the workshop into a, exactly the same workshop. I changed the title to how to get promoted using your teaching. And they queued up outside the door. It was exactly the same workshop. And what I'm saying to teachers is that if you go through this somewhat more systematic process of reviewing the changes you make to teaching, and you document it, and I don't mean screeds and screeds, I just mean you document it, and you put it in a teaching portfolio, it's there for your use. So it's a win-win situation. The students get a better deal because you continually refine. Um, you get a better deal because you've got some good evidence about your own teaching. The institution wins because you share that experience into the pool of knowledge for the organisation. So it's actually a win-win-win situation. So that is my final note. Um, questions? You see, what I think you want to do is, is think through these points before everyone basically gets handed a Moodle site and a Blackboard site and you feel that things are getting imposed upon you. That's my, my personal view after one day at the university, is that now's the time for you to make some decisions about what might be comfortable for you and then you'll win out of the situation. Questions? How to get started? Okay, all right. How to get started? Very simple. You uh, put fingers on keyboard. Um, now, seriously, if you're, if you're getting started, now I've made it abundantly clear that I don't think that lots of information uh, is helpful for learning outcomes, but it is helpful for managing learning. And students have to get, get to handle a new university. So you get your, uh, I don't know whether it's Moodle or Blackboard, I've got totally confused here, but you get your whatever the site is and you put some stuff in there. That's point number one. You actually populate it and you put an announcement up that says, 
welcome students to a happy experience in course blah, blah, blah. Okay, cheery and bright. Okay, that's easy. So you set up an announcement, you put in some notes and some PowerPoints. Um, you can undoubtedly get something from the eLearning Academy who will help you do that. Um, and then you relax for a bit. You then choose one topic only in your course in order to try and think of one of these things you'd like to try out. And you either set a discussion topic or you put up some quizzes, uh, which are meant to be sort of like for learning quizzes. So to see whether or not, you know, to help students along the way. Or, uh, and I'm not perhaps suggesting that you do this straight off. Uh, I'm saying try one thing, only one, because remember that I'm not. I'm. I'm saying that if e-learning is going to increase your workload significantly, then I don't think it's it's appropriate. I think it, it has to be just one topic. So, you set up your course website. You stick up some notes and powerpoints. You say, put up an announcement, being cheery, um, and you select one topic for one thing that semester. And then you think quite carefully about that one thing. And that's how you get started. And, and even if it takes two goes to get that, that one design right, uh, you share with your colleagues. Do you think this would be an interesting thing to do? Um, you know, try and actually get some feedback on what you're trying to do. And then you see how it goes. And um, then later on, you try something else. All of the, what I will call the e-learning champions at my university have started that way. Everyone I know who's tried to change an entire course, um, you know, straight off, gets burnt out and goes back to chalk and talk or PowerPoint. Uh, so that's the way to get started is, is to be, con well, reasonably conservative but thoughtful. In other words, making sure that whatever you try for the use of technology supports what you're trying to do in the course. And if you can make that argument, and then you explain it to the students. Say, hey, I'd like to try this this semester. Let's see how it goes. And my guess is that they'll be on side. The however many couple of hundred students I had in here earlier, they're on side. Um, if they tell you that they only want um, notes and PowerPoints, then it's maybe because your assessment needs looking at. Just one question. When you first start to implement this system and the concept, what was the biggest constraint that you faced in terms of students? Was there any constraints? The constraints are usually the institution. At the Chinese University is a research intensive university and it's the pressures on our young staff to, um, you know, for getting their research profiles up and so on. I do, I have never found the students a constraint. Then, then, and I've worked now in technology in about five or six universities. The students are, are there. Uh, get the learning design right and they will recognize that it's supporting learning. And make it interesting. Yeah. Um, so the problem is sometimes institutional. And, and, and that's why I'm saying don't do stuff that's going to increase your workload too much. If you need to, you know, as you do, need to keep your research profile active, then um, just be pragmatic. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, no? We're right then? Yep. Okay. Well, thank you very much, everyone. <laughs>